Hi guys, welcome to the first uh, episode of My Corona. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. So um, the intention for this conversation and, and what we're going to be doing that follows is to start to brainstorm about what we can do to help our situation. What are some of the innovative things we need to do to either flatten the curve, to use a cliche, or to solve problems that gets us back to normal life as quickly as possible. Um, so we've got uh, Joe Devon, who is uh, a serial entrepreneur, Silicon Beach icon, and most importantly, my brother. Uh, we've got Kevin Bass, robot scientist extraordinaire, Spanning the uh, Glendale. I love that bridge in, in Glendale. It looks it looks a lot like the Golden Gate. <laughs> it does. It looks like it, but it's it's not actually. Well, the funny thing is in Glendale, if you go down the five, there is this tiny replica right? of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Not too many people know about that. Yeah. So that's why I'm going to say you've got that Golden Gate, great Golden Gate Bridge behind you. Um, but uh, as long as we're starting, so Kevin, what is the, uh, what is the drink of choice you have with you there? It's a uh, Black Manhattan. Black Manhattan. Very Black nice. Manhattan. Um, I've got some um, chamomile tea in my Jocko mug. Are you right. drinking anything, Joe? I can call this vodka, but it's really just water. Right. <laughs> well, that'll work. Or I could call it water and maybe it's really just vodka. I'll let you decide. Either way, looks good. Um, so yeah, Joe is coming to us from the Diamond Studios in Santa Monica. Yes. Uh, very, good that, very good that Diamond could let you use their studio. That was very, yeah. very useful. Very and grateful. From my background, I'm here in downtown uh, Long Beach. And um, we've got some seagulls in the audience behind me. All right. <laughs> so... Um, in our pre-show pre meeting, I think what we wanted to talk about is uh, particularly some of the obstacles we have. Let's start out talking about 3D printing, what it can do, what it can't do, and uh, is, there, is there any area it can actually help us in our current situation? So, uh, Kevin, what, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with 3D printing and, and what you've been able to use it for? Sure. Um, we prototype almost everything using 3D printers now. Um, when it comes to robotics, you know, you're. <clears throat> it's one thing to look um, to look at a, a design in CAD, uh, you know, on SolidWorks, and and you know, look at it and and feel like things are going to fit and it's going to work well. But um, that first iteration, you know, to do it and to see, oh, I wish I would have done this differently, or I wish I would have done that differently having the ability to, to print for much less money um, and then play with it and, and then take the next iteration um, is, is amazing in, in society today to have that ability. Um, it's also relatively cheap material compared to, um, you know, compared to the process of, um, you know, doing uh, molding or, or uh, you know, injection molding or, or many other processes. Um, so I think there's definitely an advantage to that. Anybody can own a, a 3D printer, um, which how makes it. They? Um, it depends on how nice you want to go. Anywhere from what does low end cost? Five hundred dollars. And and you know high end but personal like not business. I, I don't know. There's specifically a delineage, but maybe ten thousand. Okay, so ten thousand is kind of like within the reach of, of upper, upper middle class people, if they yeah. were serious about And it. small business. Yeah. Yeah. Small business. And then once you get into the $50,000 range, you, you know, you get into like a Stratus or something that, that um, can, can, it's a huge difference once you bridge that gap and you jump up to like the 20 to 50,000. So 50,000 is much, much better than a 10,000 one. Yeah. And Typically what, it's the software and the and the accuracy so the reliability the reliability of the print um the ease of changing cartridges the amount of maintenance um the software that slices the parts to give you a better part um 
that's what, what, he what is what is the scaling difference the throughput difference um can you say that a different way yes so because so well, okay right now no, um, how many if, if you're printing something how many can you do in a day or in an hour i think that's what you're going for right martin yeah well what i'm where i'm going for is is sharing feasible is sharing a printer feasible uh, like okay right now we've got a problem that the co-working spaces don't work someone's ear someone's feedback's going on i don't know what's um all right, well, it went away. So, uh, yeah, what I'm saying is, like, ideal, you'd want to have in one, you can have 10 companies in one, one co-working space sharing a printer. Now, obviously, you can't do that. But if, uh, if you had, let's say, um, a, a bunch of people working in Santa Monica or Glendale, uh, you know, a number of, even though they're working from home, and you could do a model and you could share a model, would it be, would, would it be better if we had 10 companies had $10,000 printers or, you know, they pull together and have one $100,000 printer kind of thing, right? Well, there are a lot of companies out there, like Proto Labs being one of them, that you can send your part to them and they'll print it and then mail it to you. Okay. And I, I believe they're still working. So what's cool is, is that you do have a few companies, I believe Stratus does this as well as a few other companies where they have, you know, a, a warehouse or a room where, you know, they have a dozen or so printers, 3D printers of different types and models you send them what you're trying to print, they'll print it for you. So there's only, you know, it could be down to one person, literally, if, if you know, in, in social distancing, as of right now, you could have one, maybe two people in an entire room of printers, basically just taking care of printers, um, printing parts, pulling it off, cleaning it, shipping it, you know, you could do that. So I think that's still viable to have multiple companies sharing a, a printer space. Is this, is this something that uh, can help small businesses that right now, due to social distancing, um, there a lot of people are out of business. If they had access to a 3D printer, how hard is it to start a business and how useful is it? Like what I'm, what I'm kind of what I'm thinking of is, I know that there's some companies out there that they, they look at the reviews at Amazon and they see that there are products that people say, oh, this is not quite right, that's not quite right. What does it take? Can an individual say, hey, uh, this widget just needs an extra hole in it or needs an extra handle or something, uh, and I want to go in and I want to design a slightly different version of this product um, and then bring that to market? Is that something that's, that's a business that can grow? Because like, I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm all about the small business in particular with all these people that are, are out of work. Is this, is this a strong path? forward I, you know i think how that would look is is for someone in that arena so you know there it depends on where you're at you know can you can you cad can you use solidworks or um you know do you have that ability to to design this part yourself or does do you have to send it out and and give your idea to someone else um to design it for you and then print it so I think the the fun is, especially in time like this, you can order a printer, have it sent to your house, and then you can you can play with it. Um, I, there is, um, at least when I was purchasing printers, which was maybe two years ago, um, <clears throat> there was still a bit of a learning curve. The software wasn't quite right. You had to play with bonding materials on the plate to get it to get the part to stick and not bend up. Um, you know, there was, there were, you know, one out of every maybe three or five, three to five parts were, would not print. Um, as a hobbyist, no worries. You just, you just keep going. And, and so within that hobbyist level printer, those are some of the things that you're looking at seeing as well as print time is much, much longer and the materials are weaker. Um, so for someone like maybe yourself who has a little bit of an engineering background or, or who has the time to spend um, getting to know SolidWorks or um, Google has one, um, Google SketchUp, which I, I enjoy using, um, you can model your own part and then you can print it and you can see if it's, if it's what you want. You can use it and, and play with it. And then I think from there, once you've done a few iterations and you've actually decided, hey, this is it, this is the gold. I now want to mass produce this. I think what you would do is you would likely um, 
get, you know, connect with uh, a manufacturer, some manufacturing house, you know, you'd obviously want to pack. China? What's that? In China. <laughs> yeah, in China. Well, that's how it was going before, right? <clears throat> a lot of people were, yeah. Yeah. So what, what would happen if there was a government, um, a government program that uh, provided some funding to make that manufacturing happen here? So as an entrepreneur, you would design and, and you would design a product and then send it to them for, to mass yeah, produce? I guess what I, I guess what I'm saying is um, there was a big promise when 3D printing first came out that this was going to uh, open the door for a lot of smaller shops to bring a lot of the manufacturing back here in the States. And it hasn't really happened. It feels like it's gotten, it, it's used for prototypes, but it's not used for actual manufacturing. And, um, I, you know, it's it's pretty clear that we need to bring a lot of this stuff local. Uh, the 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 problems of the global supply chain uh, have become exposed, and we need to bring this in house, or at least a good portion of it. It'll be good for the economy, um, and and it'll be good for small business. But we need to have the government uh, really push it. But I'm just wondering if, like, what would be a good way for that to happen? How would they who, who would they fund and what would the steps be to make that possible locally? That's a good question. Um, I think with, with the printers, with the hobbyist printers, I, I think that we're not quite there yet as far as um, being able to do large, large scale at home, you know, for like a small business. I mean, unless you can afford that, you know, 20 to 50,000 or more dollar printer. It also depends on what material your is your widget going to be printed out of. Is it, yeah, is it I, aluminum? Is it, you know, and then how strong is it going to be? Is it actually going to survive? Yeah, I think that's the key point where we're, <clears throat> where three D printing isn't really understood. So the and 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 the confusing thing is with that Italy situation where someone was printing the vital part of uh, of the ventilator. So if what you want is a plastic part. As, and, 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 you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, Kevin. If what you want is a plastic part and, or something that, that it's more the shape that's important than the specific tolerances. So if something is, I don't know, brush stainless steel or something ha uh, has to hit certain heat tolerances or something has to have certain electrical properties, that's one kind of part. Another is it just needs to have this shape. So something gooey goes through it or air flows through it or what have you, then the materials are much more forgiving. So yes. the question is when you 3d print something, are you just using something for a model to mock up if something works or is it something that's, you know, okay, maybe it's not cost effective. Maybe, you know, long-term you want to manufacture it with, with something that makes each part cost 10 cents rather than $10. But right now, if we're going ten dollars apart and we need the ventilators, it it doesn't matter that it's ten dollars apart when you're three D printing it, right? Yeah, I hadn't heard that, but for something like that, <clears throat> you know, you can print multiple parts depending on how big your your bed is. You could print multiple parts at a time. <clears throat> so you know, someone you know, multiple people could be printing multiple parts and and crank out. You know, have a bunch of households working on that same part um, and crank out you know, tens of thousands. So for people that aren't familiar with the manufacturing, um, back in the, the day when I was working in the manufacturer, um, if, if, if you want something die cast or you want something that's, that's, that's made out of rubber or, or those kind of materials, the designer would spend a lot of time prototyping a particular part and then they would come with a set of schematics and a set of tolerances and there would be some test runs that you would do before you actually had a production run. And then, you know, yeah, it's going to hit these tolerances and you were clear on what the tests would go and, and what have you. So what the, what the 3d printing is magical for is it, back in the day, you would need to, to come up with, it just would take so long because you come up with what you think the part needs to look like and you prototype something. It takes you, depending on the complexity of the part, it could take you a week or a month to come up with an iteration. And then I said, like, nope, it's not quite working. Got to do it again. 
having a 3d printer you could try put all these different pieces together yep that works you could do in two days what it would take you to do in two months but still it's not the end part that you're using right yeah so um going back to joe's question originally what you're trying to do so i, I think we were shortcutting a little bit too much so in italy there was a situation where they had a, a shortage of ventilators and if they were able to 3d print a part it would make uh, it was what was what was missing to make a, a number of ventilators and they were able to 3d print them there's a postscript to the story where i think that the manufacturer i i saw the story i couldn't believe it that the 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 manufacturer that actually owned the ip was suing the person that 3d printed it um i have a feeling yeah. they're not going to win their suit um but that's neither here nor there the point here is um on one level i think joe what you're talking about can we solve problems about important parts that we need for ventilators or, or other issues by 3D printing. And the other piece you're looking at is, can we use this kind of technology to rebuild small business within, within the US? So, so what's interesting is as we were talking, uh, it, it kind of hit me a, a little bit of an, a different idea around crowdsourcing 3D printing. You know how Amazon has this ability where you go in and you say that you need to process, like NASA sometimes needs to process uh, millions of images because they get all these images from space. So they just spin up a thousand machines on Amazon for like 20 minutes. They process everything they need and they spin it down and they only spend the 20 minutes that they need and they get an instant um, uh, rendering uh, that might in the past have taken them months to do or even years to do. So wouldn't it be interesting, and I don't know if this is solving a real problem or not, but wouldn't it be interesting if, uh, if an organization needed a large number of parts very quickly, if you could have a consortium, a business that, that um, had a whole bunch of people that had 3D printers in their homes and everybody could 3D print and like ship it the next day, all of a sudden you get a ton of stuff. I think the shipping costs might be prohibitive, but maybe for certain industries, the, the ability to do that just in time ordering and get a, a quick delivery of a large number might be of use. Maybe I'm crazy, but just you know, that, me. That's really interesting, Joe. I, I think that what would be, how cool would it be if we had like an, like a, an Uber type, <clears throat> an Uber type system? Here's a business idea for you. You have an Uber type business, but instead of Uber, it's uh, people with 3D printers. Mm -hmm. So you, you set up a business model and you have a website with a portal that says what type of material do you want to print with? How accurate does the part need to be? What is the part? And you would be basically the face of it. And then you would have a bunch of people who like Uber would rent out their, you know, they would buy their own printer and then they would, mm -hmm. they would rent out, you know, basically you would pay them per part. And so then based on the number of parts you need, you know, multiple people could be printing that part multiple, you know, and then, and then you could either have a, if it's local, you could have a delivery service. I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but we've actually had a few times where we needed a, a part from the machine shop that was, you know, say, you know, maybe only 20 minutes away, but with traffic an hour, well, that's two and a half, three hours of an engineer's time. So we just call Uber as if we were getting in the car <laughs> and instead just put the part in the car, yeah, right? So right. You can use them as couriers. Yeah. So you could potentially, if it's local, you could do the same thing. Otherwise they could just ship out the, you know, ship out the product the next day. Right. That's yeah. a really interesting I, idea. I think the quality would be, could be a problem, but I, I just wonder if this solves anybody like, like here we have a problem where we need a, a, a million uh, ventilator valves, right? So yeah. it's like, hey, here's a million people with a printer, boom, print it out, and you have this in an emergency. So, but I just don't know how big a business this is. But well, it'd be an interesting the quality, thing for somebody else. the quality is not really the issue. I mean, you could, just like in Uber, you can you can hire a limousine, you can get an SUV, or you can get a you know a whatever minimum car you've got. You could say, okay, I need this printed to this level of quality whether that's specifying the printer you want it printed on or the tolerance that you have or something. Or the and type of material. Yeah. Yep. And you put your, you put your, uh, cat, you, you, do, you put in your CAD file or whatever, you know, here's the formats that we accept. And if you don't know exactly what quality you have, then 
you know, the front end consultant, you know, someone talks to Kevin and goes, so what is it you're trying to do? And what is it you want? Well, if you need to this level of quality, it'll cost you this amount. Right. I just mean if, if the goods arrive and you have 10,000 of them, particularly if it's like a valve for, uh, for a ventilator, right? What if the quality is just not there for 10 of them, right? You have to have then, some type of, uh, of quality control. You yeah, where you don't pay for it if, if it doesn't reach the tolerance. So yeah, uh, well, I'm saying it's not easy, but I think there might be a place to use here. What were you going to say? Not, not only that, but, you know, sometimes you have layer separation on the part or you have mm -hmm. uh, imperfections on the part based on how it was made. Um, some parts need to be cleaned if there's, um, you know, if you have like, a, let's say you're doing a box in order to get that top layer, there's a second layer inside that you have to remove, right? So there's a lot of things that quality control would need to inspect. So you would need that infrastructure as well. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the other thing that I was really aiming at earlier was we were talking about 50,000 being out of range for a lot of small business. But if the government, like now the government's doling out money. So uh, in order to support business, so if they were doling out some money for small business and said, hey, here's a category of things we'll give you a $50,000 loan for, and one of them would be a 3D printer, if this is a big enough business, uh, that that would warrant it. It'd be kind of an interesting approach where you're just trying to kickstart a particular industry. Yeah, I you know I I wonder <clears throat> what business would utilize that that's not already utilizing that. You know, yeah, it's mean? more for for new businesses, I I'd say. But but again, this is just kicking some ideas out there. I don't know if it's if it's viable or not. Yeah, I, I think there is, there's definitely some viability. I mean, I think that, you know, that Uber, uh, you know, that Uber-ish idea, right? Um, yeah. would be, I think th there's some, definitely some um, merit to that. I, I, I think, unfortunately, for, for all the small businesses, I think there's a, uh, there's a degree you have to either, you know, roll with the times or, or change or, you know, I, I don't think that a 3D, you know, the 3D printer, there's a niche for it that absolutely, I think, would be 100% viable. Um, there's a, a set of, of, of companies out there or people who want to start their own companies that that would be the perfect fit. And then I think there's a bunch out there where, where it wouldn't and they would need to find some other, some other way. <clears throat> um, and, and I don't know what that looks like, you know, especially restaurants right now. It's you know, it's, it's tough. I mean, they're, they're shut down. I mean, and, and, uh, Martin was saying that, uh, one of our friends who owns a business that, you know, even though they're, they're stepping up and doing takeout, it's still a very, it's a much smaller amount of business. And I can imagine the cost to keep the doors open. You, uh, you've been to that place. Like it's, it's huge, yeah. right? You, yeah. you don't need that level of re, uh, restaurant, that size of restaurant to, uh, to do takeout. Yeah. yeah, to pay that rent is, is definitely tricky. And, yeah. and wouldn't it be cool if, if we figured out a way to, whether it's through masks that are a little less, uh, um, A, first available, but B, uh, we're more comfortable and all of that, that would allow us to get a little closer. Like uh, I saw an interesting article that the drive-in theaters here in LA, I didn't even know they still had it. Uh, the drive-ins are doing pretty well. You can still go to a movie. You just oh, drive, cool. do a drive-in. Or yeah. like like there used to be A&W where it was like, uh, uh, what was that movie with Ron Howard, um, George Lucas's first movie, American Graffiti? Um, you know how you had those restaurants where you just drive up to it? Like that would be interesting to be in a restaurant through your car if they brought that back. Well, they've got, they, yeah. So that that would be more labor intensive, but the, the drive-ins, you don't even need, you know, in the, in the old days you had the little thing you put on your car. Now they just put it through your FM radio. So you get the sound in your car. Um, yeah. so you don't even yeah. have to roll down your windows. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bluetooth. But yeah. You bring the food. You mean, so like the A and W where you bring your burger and what have you. Yeah. Um, you order on your, on your mobile phone, you say where you are or something or, and yeah. then they bring it to you and drop it in a way that you don't have to, like breathe on them <laughs> yeah you know. yeah they put it on a container and then they go and then you can roll down your window yeah for sure so 
Yeah, that would definitely, yeah. that would definitely work. So hopefully some entrepreneurs yeah. are getting ideas from this and, and doing something. It'd be great to retrofit an existing restaurant with that. You know, my, my chiropractor did something interesting that I didn't think about. So he's, he's is still, they're still open. And what they're doing is they're, um, they're breaking up the appointments so that there's no one person in the office at a time. So I'll go in for my appointment. He gives me a 30 hour window. I go in, I have whatever time I'm, I have, and then I leave. And then the next person is scheduled after me. Yeah. So he's already done cleaning by the time the next person arrives. And I thought, how clever is that? you know, to really honor the social distancing distancing, and to honor the cleanliness, but it's still at the same time provide a service. I imagine he can't get his, the same number of people through in a day, but it's better than closing the doors. Hey, but you know what? I bet you the patients feel like they're getting a, a lot better service. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I wonder, but the reason I bring it up, I wonder if restaurants couldn't do something similar. You yeah. know, see, here's the... The problem, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but it, my problem is like, it seems that we live in a society where it's the, it's the one person to screw it up for all, right? So you have a restaurant, let's just say you have a restaurant who opens and they're, you know, they're, they've got maybe, you know, in a, in a huge space, they have four tables, right? In, in a space that's way more than enough. Um, and they're doing appointments just like that, where you're not, you know, they're doing it properly. They're cleaning things down. But then you have another restaurant who opens up, who's not doing, not following that rules, not putting that same level of ownership into it. And, and I believe, honestly, I believe that's why our lockdown, and we're not really in a lockdown, but our, what the safer at home, um, why, <laughs> why this is keeps elevating notches is because you have people who don't care who are out there like oh i'm not going to get sick or if i do i'm not going to die so i don't care you know they're just out there doing whatever they want to do and they're not applying to these sure but but if this goes on for a long time i mean people are going to have to come up with some solutions and i and i'm you know i used to be on the executive committee of the lx coastal chamber of commerce um, I met, I had a call with, uh, with um, somebody who runs it over there and uh, she was telling me that a lot of businesses already have gone, out, have gone bankrupt uh, in, in the week that this has gone on. And I'm sure that the, the Chambers of Commerce together uh, will be more than happy to lobby and, and get some attention from, um, from the government to say, all right, if you follow these rules, you can open up a restaurant. We just have to identify what those rules could be. And, uh, and there would be probably some exceptions to allow this to happen. Yeah. Maybe not if it's a month, but if this lasts longer, then. Yeah. Yeah. If it, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I hate to, it's, it's difficult to think. It's so surreal. This, uh, this whole experience. You know, it just doesn't seem real. I, all the information is coming through on TV, you know, and, and right now we're, we're here until uh, April 19th. So, yeah, to think the possibility of it lasting, of the lot, you know, the hunker, you know, stay in place, safe at home um, is longer than that. We, we definitely are going to have to make some changes. Well, well part of the problem yeah. is that as a society and particularly our leaders, aren't really any good at risk management. And, um, you know, if you, you look at our manufacturing, you, you know, this sounds political, but it's really not political. If you take a look at just the, the numbers, the, the reason so much of the, you've got a global supply chain is because we're looking purely at profit and not looking at risk. But if you're running a company that goes out of business, well, how good was that model to be purely on profit and having no risk. If, um, if you can't get critical parts out of China and forget again that it's a communist country and all that other stuff, they have 2 billion people. If we have a million masks in their country, you're asking a lot of leaders, even though legally it's American mask, even though legally we paid for the manufacturing of it, they've got a lot of people they need to help. And, um, and, so they're keeping the masks in their country. 
such a huge percentage. I read something, something like 20% of the components of the drugs, but it gets to more like 50%. When, so a lot of the drugs we get, the components come from China. But if you look at the components that come from Europe, they have components that come from China, right? So if, depending on how you count, anywhere from 20 to 60% of our drugs. I heard 90% somewhere today. Depending on how you count, right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, so we're counting on China for our, our drugs and we're counting on, uh, you know, we're basically counting on other places for critical pieces of the supply chain. And again, forget all the political stuff. If you just look at it from a risk, from a tail risk, perspective if you read you know Nassim Talib's work on the black swan and anti-fragile he predicted a lot of this to begin with because the curve is uh, you know you get every last cent of profit versus keep you know assessing your risk and go can if, if, if we hit this level of outsourcing we now don't have a bad like if you had the manufacturer and I used to work for manufacturers here in LA if you have manufacturers that they're, they're not going to get rich, but they'll stay in business because you want to have a second source, you've got to give them a certain amount of money. And we just stopped doing that. We're like, oh, we don't care. But how does it make sense to um, have your supply an ocean away? You want to have some percentage of your supply onshore, at least in Mexico or in, in California. Um, and I think some of the changes are going to happen. Forget again, this is not political. This is not about any of that stuff. It's just, you know, look, pure business, pure risk, supply chain. Um, if investors are smarter, you don't want to invest in somebody that isn't properly assessing a risk. Um, yeah. And you look well, let at alone though, what about hardware? Like if, if there's a war and our hardware is being made in China, or, we're, or you know, we're outside the states. If we don't have the chops anymore to make the hardware, then you know, we're not going to do well in a war. Yeah. So something something to be said for being a self-sustaining society. Yes. Exactly. Oh, very um, very sobering, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, this is a little off topic, but uh, I was at, uh, I was um, picking up some, um, I had to pick up some supplies from, uh, from Home Depot and uh, I was checking out and, um, you know, there was one, one lady at one of the counters who was, who was scanning all the thing, all of the things in the cart for everybody. She had gloves on. So it was just one person using the scanner. And then there was another woman really not doing anything, just talking, gossiping with, with another coworker about her life, not paying any attention. And, um, and she's like, Oh yeah, just scan it yourself. And, and I'm like, you know, how many other people have touched this, this scanner in the last five minutes? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I just said, Hey, you know, it would be a great idea if you guys, you know, had some kind of like hand sanitizer or gloves, or if you just scanned it for us or something. And uh -huh. yeah. Right. And you know, she got, she, she started getting a little defensive about it. And then the guy from the next aisle over, like really came at me was like, you need to call home Depot and, and talk to them. They're the ones you need to talk to. I'm like, well, she's boots on the ground. I'm just, you know, I was totally polite and calm, like, you know, like I am and, and just, you know, engaging her in a conversation and, and, uh, and he was just aggressive and like, you know, this isn't her problem. It's not her fault. Call home Depot. And it's like, it's not, you know, I, there was, there was a split second where if I would have said one more word, I would have gotten into a physical fight. Wow. Yeah, I think I think some people are losing it. And <clears throat> I think we forget that we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, I Joe, one of the things I really appreciate about the conversation that you wanted to have tonight is your um your passion and your interest and your commitment to the local businesses that are hurting right now. Yeah. And um more people need to think like you and, and, and to be doing that out of the box thinking and, and to be in this conversation, how can we support local businesses? How can we, you know, 
for those of us lucky enough to have not lost a job, how do we support those that have? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, um, you know, having, having my own business and always being an entrepreneur, it's just in the blood for me, but, uh, it, it's, it's like, there's, there's lobbying going on for the big corporations, but there isn't lobbying enough lobbying for small business. Yeah. Um, there, there are ways to, to do it and you really need to join your local chamber of commerce because that's really the way to do it. Um, but, but I find that we've got our hands tied behind our back, especially in California. And you just can't understand that until you've had to make payroll and, and you can't understand the importance when you're making payroll and you have a large number of employees and you're providing a great job for them. Um, and, and when you have, you know, a, a massive burden on you, and you're just not supported by the government. They, they don't, you're invisible to them. And mm-hmm. now more than ever, it's important for small business to be heard. Yeah. Because we've I mean, been what, decimated. What a time to do that. I can't remember what the AB something. It the was. AB5. There, there, is, there is lobbying going on to get that. Uh, uh, We're talking about the, the, the law in, in California that, that stopped all the gig workers from getting jobs and yeah yeah so like a lot of uber drivers were fired a lot of journalists were fired because like for journalists you can't do more than 30 articles for a publication or they either have to hire you or they can't use you oh wow yeah yeah i mean there's within what period of time one year oh wow yeah so for example if if, uh, if we want to hire a programmer um, who wants to be a contractor, they do not want to be a full-time employee or a W-2 employee. We are not, because we're in the business of doing development, we cannot hire um, a contractor. We have to hire um, as an employee, even though we don't want this person as an employee and they don't want it to be an employee, we are required by law to do it. Wow. So this is this is uh, a big a big hurt there there you know as usual with with uh, government um there are good intentions and it was passed for good intentions but the unintended consequences are far worse than the problem they were trying to solve yeah yep so it is uh, it is difficult yeah. any any other topics you want to cover tonight I, I think we solved all the problems in the world so far <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see uh, government um, make it easier to uh, to provide credit to small business. I think that that's one where they talk a lot about SBA loans, but for the SBA loans, you're going to have to go to a really major bank, go through a lot of hoops. It's a royal pain in the butt. Uh, we we did the TARP, eight hundred billion to to ease the credit uh, from the banks. And they were supposed to ease it to the small business and they never did. Um, it takes a long time to build up that credit when you're a small business. When you don't need the money, then there'll be plenty of money there for you. And considering how many, how many big companies have been bailed out, I think it's time to uh, provide something a little better than the, the SBA with a little so, bit less uh, overhead. So, so I don't remember small- which... I don't remember which senator this. I mean, you may not have heard this. Let's see if I can find it. There was a, I want to say Senator Cruz, but it may have been somebody else who uh, came up with the idea of these forgivable loans. So what do they mean by forgivable? So let's say they, they're your small business owner. They give you a million dollar loan. If you use it to pay employees, then you don't have to pay it back. If you use it for something else, then it's a loan you've got to pay back as a way to quickly, in other words, if you've got- You're talking about a a current proposal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. So instead of, why would you do that? Why not just give the money directly to people? Well, because you want to save the company. So let's say you're my friend with a restaurant. And if, you know, let's say you you give him uh, $100,000, so maybe he's making enough money out of his take his his takeaway business where he can pay some of the money for the rent, but he's got to shed as many employees as possible. Well, if he keeps his employees, he's got a hundred thousand dollars. He can use that to make payroll, 
and that gets completely forgiven. The advantage of doing it that way is they keep their benefits, they keep, they keep their job, and the company is stayed whole for a while while it does that. I'm, I think that's a very good way of distributing. Absolutely. That, that's a no, it's a no brainer. Yes. So um, hopefully we're going to get more ideas like that. And hopefully that goes, that, that, that happens, that actually happens. Because that's the way to help small business as opposed to big business. And, you know, as Kevin, I know you work for a pretty big business. Um, you know, I know that big businesses need help too. Um, so it's not, you know, I, I don't, there's some way we need to balance both of them. But um, we're in a situation where um, if we don't help a lot of people and we don't help them in a way that sustains our economy, there's like two things going on. Everyone needs to eat. So we want to make sure people can eat. Everyone needs to either pay their rent or some, some way where it gets forgiven. I don't know how that would work. That's, you know, I know a lot of economics, but that's complicated stuff. But uh, beyond it, we don't. So like, like you said, how many companies went bankrupt? Well, what happens is it's kind of like survival of the fittest, the, you know, in the herd, the, the, the sick gazelle gets eaten first. So the ones that are barely making it lose first, but other perfectly healthy well, companies. Well, what I've seen is there's, there's a couple of cases where, you know, there's some businesses that did, did really well over the years. They have enough money, you know, they're not spring chickens anymore. And they're like, oh, I just don't have it in me to fight anymore. I have enough money and, and they let it go. And it's not that they're a gazelle, but at the same time, they, they, uh, you know, they're keeping it going. They like that they have employees, but they just, you know, they can't operate on in a profitable basis. So they're like, I, I give it up. And then downstream, all these jobs are lost. Sure. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is the, I get the, the, the weakest companies are going to go first. And, you know, that's, I'm not saying I'm happy about that, but obviously like if you can't last a week, then how strong is your business? But how many companies, you know, like if you look at Disney, for example, they're a huge company, have a lot of money, but how many days have the parks been closed now? This has been over a week. The parks have been closed. Then and look at that. If you look at the riots in Hong Kong closing down the first Disney park, and then the yep. virus closing in Shanghai, so they've been down for a while now. Yep. And you look at the movie companies. Well, you know they they might make a lot of money, but all movie theaters close. So the movie theater chains and all that real estate doesn't matter how well you run great they might have a month runway to completely close down but you know they're so that's yeah, what i'm I mean, saying is like what what does content look like everybody's moving to ott you also have, you have that big disney plus uh, initiative how are they going to create content for it when you have all the social distancing and they're they really need i assume that they're ramping up their production in order to how are they going to ramp up to, production no yeah, i'm saying until this happened right i'm saying until this happened they were ramping up their production i assume so now, you know, it's all done. And I think we have to figure out, here's, there's another opportunity is figure out how to make content in the age of social distancing. Yep. Well, I mean, I think this, this podcast is an experiment in that, right? But Sure. Uh, uh, Quibi is an interesting company because they, uh, you should check their keynote out at CES. They are, they, they're making it for mobile first. And so, they have an interesting concept that when you 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 know you turn your phone around horizontal or vertical oh, it's not showing here um, if you turn it around horizontal or vertical it works both ways and they've they've looped into their content um, or, or they've made it part of the story so that you as a, as a person have a conversation with somebody and text messages and all of that and you can see the person you can see a video of the person holding the phone or if you flip it then you're actually seeing what they're seeing through the phone. And that's an interesting model for, for content that could work. And they could, there's, there could certainly be stories about social distancing where they show this kind of thing as part of the drama. Yeah. I mean, that, that definitely makes sense. But I have friends who uh, I was talking to one of, one of the creative friends I have who's both a musician and she's, a, uh, she's, she's an actor. And so she'd been, you know, she'd been on a variety of different productions. So all the productions shot down. She also tours and, you know, does gigs in, in different places. Um, so both of those avenues are, are out. And then she's also got, 
you know, she does, she has an Airbnb and, you know, no one's paying that. Sure, so, yeah. Right. So she's, you know, she's, she's in a difficult position, right? Um, you just imagine that times a million. So if you're a struggling actor, when you succeed, you've got a production. When you don't, you're, you're waiting tables. You know, there's a yeah. lot of that in California. Right. So well, they're not waiting tables now. No. So it's, uh, it's pretty challenging for everybody. So, um, all right. Well, I think that that'll do it for tonight. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, till next time, uh, signing off. All right.